Uh, good morning. Uh, I can't see all of you, but I think I hope you had a good uh, parties last night. I heard they were great. I was seeing pictures on on my WeChat group and my team. Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Subhu Alam Raju. I haven't had coffee this morning, so I'll try to speak loud and and stay energized uh, looking at all of you. I know it's the uh, last day of the summit, and uh, Keystone is probably not the most exciting thing happening in cloud. Uh, it is probably the most boring project that you may consider. And uh, if it is boring, I wouldn't talk about it, and I'm sure you wouldn't be here. And, and, and so, uh, so I'm going to spend uh, some time on what we, how we use Keystone at eBay. Uh, what have we, we been doing uh, to make it uh, to make it really uh, work for our cloud? And the reason uh, and why we took the approaches we took. Uh, the hard work for this talk was done by two of my colleagues, uh, Davi Ding, uh, and who is the the lead for our IAS uh, layer, and uh, and Feng Zhu, who's uh, leading the identity and access management uh, project at eBay. And these guys could not be here, so I uh, took over that uh, the talk and, and tried to do my best in, in giving you, uh, staying truthful to the topic. So why Keystone at the center of the universe? I think what has been happening uh, in at eBay, and I'm sure it's happening throughout the industry, is that control plane is getting more and more important than data plane. If you go to the traditional enterprise, maybe five years ago, you know, it's all about filing tickets and spinning up VMs, and then you forget about control plane after that. Things are running. Now we are getting to a time where actions are happening. The cloud is changing very often. The traffic on the cloud is increasing on the control plane. APIs are getting more and more important because availability, security, and, and provisioning all these things are happening programmatically. And to make this work at scale, you need a rock solid control plane. And that's the realization a lot of us have come to in the last few years. That's why you see folks trying a lot on HA for the control plane more than the data plane. So uh, what is our, what does our universe look like? Before I actually talk about that, I want to uh, make a couple of disclaimers. Uh, one is that uh, the stuff we did is a bit somewhat dated. Uh, we, some of the stuff we did is based on Havana of uh, OpenStack, and we upgraded later on. Uh, similarly, some of the enhancements that we made to Keystone for identity and access management are still internal. We have not yet been able to commit the blueprints and then push up steam. I uh, hope to get that process started so soon, uh, the team is still busy getting up to uh, uh, getting productizing the, the, those some of the features we did. So that's my disclaimer. So what does our universe look like? As I said before, uh, the control plane is is extremely important for our business. At eBay, for example, a developer can come to a cloud and say, "Hey, deploy my new app with this C name." make it available everywhere, and that action takes about 30 minutes. The code is running everywhere. That means uh, uh, a lot of provisioning access activities that happen throughout the control plane, not just the compute OpenStack layer, but other platforms that exist. So I want to go over how our universe looks like, why Keystone is getting more and more uh, central to what we do. Uh, we have this notion of availability zones. This is pretty standard in every, in every cloud deployment today. And all of us, most of us have more than one deployment of OpenStack. And we took this very seriously in the sense in our deployment, in our data centers, we have a number of these availability zones. Each of these zones are totally decoupled from one another. Each AZ is a full OpenStack deployment, so we have done the complete automation of the, of the cloud itself so that I could, once the, the metal is provisioned, once the network is racked and cabled, I can use some scripts to bring up a new AZ. And the idea of an AZ is a coarse-grained fault domain. 
that is if something goes wrong with one AZ, it is not impacting another AZ. So that is a promise we try to maintain for, for the business. So if a, an application wants to be available and resilient to failures, they are expected to provision across multiple availability zones. So that's a, it's, earlier we used to think of a rack or a half rack as a fall domain. Now we have moved away to a much larger coarse grained uh, fall domain, which is an availability zone. So when you have these multiple availability zones, uh, where can I find the cloud? Is it a common question? Like, should I, which endpoint should I use? What is the protocol to use? How do I log in? Do my, do my credentials work everywhere? Uh, what is where? Like, you know, you have many, many services in, in, in our service catalog, and uh, you have to know the endpoints to use them. Uh, and a and lot of provisioning activities happen across AZ. Because there, when there are multiple AZs, you want to deploy code, spread the code around, application around. That means you are orchestrating, uh, whether it's G load balancers or DNS or provisioning. You are spanning these operations across the globe and across all of AZs. And you want to keep that consistency. And you want to maintain users and roles consistently across all these AZs. And those are the problems that we started with late, uh, early last year. The second complication that, uh, that adds to this is, uh, is the notion of a VPC. Uh, we are promise, our, our fundamental principle at, of cloud, uh, building cloud at eBay is to uh, treat infrastructure as a shared resource and not a dedicated resource. That means uh, whether you have uh, dev test workloads or, or a production workloads of different kinds, even when, when we say production, there are different kinds of production for different, with different policies and, and, and expectations. So we modeled, uh, we borrowed this term called virtual private cloud from Amazon uh, way back in 2012. But we went beyond uh, Amazon's definition of VPC, which is, uh, Amazon's definition was, it's, a, it's an isolated, segmented uh, network, uh, network segmented zone within Amazon's public cloud infrastructure. But we go beyond that and define policies of who can do what where and whether a person can do these actions and, and, and or not, those policies we define uh, in the context of an a, a VPC. We don't have many of these VPCs. There are about 10 VPCs, but, but they are, all have the same services. So when we launch a service, a feature, and it's there for dev, it's there for product, it's there for everything. It's not that we launch the devs, some, some feature for dev only and something for prod only. That we want to maintain that consistency so that when somebody builds a platform, that's running on cloud infrastructure, want to make sure that they get the same expectations. If it works through some APIs in for dev test mode, it has to work provided you have the right policy, you conform to the policy in production. So that's, that's how we uh, approach to cloud. Uh, and they have different auth and access policies. For example, if I'm doing dev test, I might just use a single factor authentication, which is my corp login and password. But if I'm using a, a mission critical application that is, that is important for the business, that change may, have to, may need two-factor authentication. So it, it's not, we have to do that support. And moreover, there are cases where uh, there are machines doing operations. It's not, it's not a human being. So your corp credentials or two-factor authentication don't even work. So we need to support all that uh, flavor of uh, use cases when you have this, uh, such a multi-tenant uh, cloud infrastructure. And what's make even more interesting is that uh, I think some of you who attended eBay talks before uh, knew th should know this is that we have taken an approach where our APIs are open for all our developers, uh, and and uh, we want to make sure that there is one way to do authentication for all cloud services, not five different ways, because it's first of all it's not secure if you everyone is collecting credentials, and you want to make sure there's one entry point for authentication, one way to generate tokens, one way to revoke them, consistent policy. And so as we started adding more and more platforms on top of our basic cloud primitives, which is compute, storage, and, and network, we uh, my started migrating other platforms onto the same model. So we have arrived at this model called a trusted control plane, which is the set of APIs, services, you use on the site for provisioning, software deployment, monitoring, 
and remediation. So all the APIs, the complete life cycle of operations that you do for cloud are part of this trusted control plane. And, and there are APIs for provisioning, like the, like the PaaS layers. We have built homegrown uh, access service for different use cases like you know, Elasticsearch and, uh, and, uh, and caching and things like that. Some of these may end up in open source, some of these may not. Uh, we are still going through uh, developing, development and, and production, productizing the, uh, those services. These Kubernetes, we are investing in Kubernetes as a layer, as a cluster management layer on top of OpenStack primitives. And that too needs credentials and, and have a consistent policy of access control. And there are a ton of other homegrown cloud services that we have in, at eBay. And there is headless access. People that don't have their machines operating uh, with the cloud infrastructure, to, uh, the, with the APIs. So all these layers exist uh, above, uh, around uh, our Keystone infrastructure. So our control plane started with the three, four services three years ago. Now it's, it has many, many services. It doesn't even fit in half a rack anymore. It includes object uh, block, uh, compute network, and, and all these other services. And in addition, we have services below the, uh, the cloud, which are, are operational services. They also need the same kind of things, like who can create networks, who can onboard networks, who can provision hypervisors, who can decline hypervisors, who can uh, evict hypervisors, the whole bunch of tools and operators using it. So again, we want to make sure there's a consistent policy and, uh, 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 of, of identity and access management. So that has led to this model that uh, this, this realization about, uh, about a year and a half ago that we got to have Keystone as the center of our universe, uh, as, which is, has to be global. That means if I create tokens in one place, I need to be able to use the tokens everywhere. I should have one set of policies that are governed and managed in one way. And there should be only one entry point for authentication and access control for the cloud, not five different ways of authentication. It should be available. That means because every operation in the cloud is using, is authenticated, except the part of getting token itself, you want to make sure that the ident IAM itself is available globally and it's secure for obvious reasons without actually managing users. Because we are still not managing users. There are other systems in the company that manage users. There's Corp LDAP, there are other LDAP systems that are managed uh, by other teams that have their own policies of how they store and, and rotate passwords and all that. We don't want to get into the business of doing all that work. We still want them to do the work. Same thing for two-factor authentication. We don't manage two-factor authentication, but there are systems that manage two-factor authentication. So without actually managing users, we want to have uh, the IAM uh, built in at eBay. And we have untrusted cloud users, and we have semi-trusted cloud services in the control plane. So we want to address all the use cases. That's how we started. Uh, that's how the Keystone became uh, so, in, so important uh, in, in, our, in, our, in our stack. In fact, if Keystone is down, uh, cloud halts. Uh, every, every part of cloud halts. I mean, VMs still keep working, but how good is it if you can't change it? So we did uh, three, uh, three important uh, uh, changes, to the, uh, uh, changes to the way we deployed, deployed cloud. For example, when we started uh, our initial OpenStack deployment, there was one. We didn't care. Uh, one, one, one AZ. We didn't care much. But as the number grew over time, this project became, uh, these activities became very, very important. So the three things are a global keystone and the notion of a trusted control plane. Uh, then the second fact, authentication. And the third is a set notion of API keys. Uh, those are, as I said before, extensions that we made in-house. They are not public. They are not uh, yet being contributed uh, upstream. Uh, we, are, we, have to work, we have some work to do on those respects. So let me go over uh, the how of, uh, of these, these features, and then I can open for questions. Uh, the design that we uh, used for Keystone is fairly straightforward. As I said before, when, before we thought about this, we had multi we had already launched a couple of availability zones and there are already users and projects and whatnot uh, on those, uh, in those availability zones. Each using its own Keystone instance. That means we had to uh, work out a, a, a model where 
we can migrate the data without impacting our, our existing users and projects and their resources. That took, in fact, uh, the longest time in, in this process. So the design was uh, fairly straightforward and, and, uh, and, and repeatable. Uh, at, the, at the bottom of the picture, you see the, uh, you see the databases, which are MySQL instances. And uh, uh, the way we set up is that we have uh, n number of these availability zones. Each has a, a load balancer, uh, sorry, a, a MySQL cluster. And, uh, and we use Galera uh, to, to replicate certain tables uh, uh, across uh, globally. Now there are, there are some trade-offs in this process. Uh, the the first first issue was uh, uh, we started with the assumption that uh, uh, we only need these two tables like users and roles. Let's see what happens. We started digging through the code and looking at all the dependencies, and and we s wanted to set a design constraint that we don't want to touch tokens. We want to leave the tokens where they are and see if it works. And then we went to, went in dug into the code and realized. Oh crap! Uh, there is uh, tokens everywhere, and and it's uh, it's so strongly uh, coupled such that you have to replicate tokens. And there are why tokens are a problem because, as you access control plane, not every client is smart enough to cache tokens. So they just forget about, they just ignore what they have right now, and they create a new token every time, and they do try to do something. And so there's a lot of traffic. For example, uh, a recent peak we had was about. 8 million tokens in a single day. And we were surprised, oh, this is, uh, this is not expected. We were not expecting that much traffic on the control plane. These were fresh tokens minted on a given day. That was a peak recently. And that's been growing over month over month uh, since we launched early this year. So each uh, MySQL cluster uh, has a load balancer whip, and on top of which we have a, a DNS. Uh, uh, we use a commercial product for, 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 the, for the DNS uh, uh, entries. So they have a DNS whip, but and then on top of that we have the clusters of Keystone servers in each uh, in each AZ, and and the DNS is configured such that if an AZ is looking for a MySQL, it'll find the the nearest, which is the local uh, Keystone whip. It'll it'll do the reads and writes from that, and and the st the model repeats on top of uh, uh, the Keystone. They have a load balancer whip and then another DNS entry. So from the user's point of view, there is one single entry point. We may add more AZs or remove AZs. The user doesn't see all that. We can fail over. The user doesn't get impacted. All the user sees is one global entry point uh, for, for, for Keystone. So that it, it makes it easy for him, for the user to discover, uh, use the same token everywhere uh, in every AZ. Now, uh, the trade-offs are here are, is that, uh, obviously, the, the rights, because uh, Galera is a multi-master uh, replication system which is using certification-based uh, 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 rights. Rights take longer. Uh, there is a penalty for rights because the rights have to be propagated everywhere. You look for conflicts and then decide to commit or roll back. So right cost increases, but uh, reads don't go through the same penalty because they are, they are read locally from the local databases. So that's the trade-off. That's a bullet we bit knowing well into the picture, uh, early, early in the process. So as of uh, recently, uh, if I look at the, stat, the stat traffic trends, uh, I, I, I removed the graphs because they were, not, uh, they were showing too much data than I wanted to. Uh, there were about 10 take new tokens per second on average. That's, that's the kind of traffic we are getting now. And the peak was up to 100 tokens per second. And so initially we had some surprises and like Keystone getting down and all that. So we, we had to figure out and put some rate limits and, and, and so on and so on to ensure that we have uh, uh, the Keystone is surviving the traffic. The write latencies are, are high. It is not ideal. And we have to uh, think of ways to improve that. Part of it is also uh, dependent on the underlying infrastructure, whether it's uh, the LDAP or two-factor authentication system. So the cost, overall cost is high, and also the Galera cost is there adding up. The read latencies, if you directly go to Keystone, it's about 200 milliseconds right now. We started with PKI, which is a very naive choice, because we were upgrading from Falsum, and, and we didn't change the configuration to use PKIZ. And that uh, realized, oh crap, these uh, tokens are getting longer and longer. And we had use cases using Swift, and they're exchanging tokens. And, the, and if you're exchanging a 1K of an object, you have 
ton of uh, metadata with the request because of the token size. So we went and switched to PKIZ, which was a very simple, straightforward config change, which dropped uh, the token size to by 60%, uh, which was awesome. But I think the most ideal situation is to have uh, ephemeral tokens uh, that, that you don't need to replicate so that we get higher write latencies. And also Galera becomes much cooler system because if you take tokens out, the number of writes that happen for users and projects is much, much less traffic-wise. It will trickle down to many, many times in terms of uh, the traffic to uh, the keystone itself. So uh, that, that somehow that blueprint never happened in the, in the community. And there's also a great talk the other day, I think, by an engineer from IBM on the types of tokens and the new kind of token that are coming in, uh, in Keystone. We might take a look at it and, and see if we can reduce uh, uh, the right latencies and make the system more, more resilient. Because when you have millions of tokens getting created every day, we have also worry about purging the tokens without freezing the database. So initial at our initial attempts where we had some incidents where the script to purge the tokens kicks up and then Keystone froze because the entire table was locked. And so we had to figure out, uh, we had to actually patch Keystone to uh, make, uh, move the data of yesterday's, like previous day's tokens to a different table and then restart, start with a fresh table so that we, the cleanup operations don't impact Keystone. And th th these, some of these changes we couldn't get to the c community in time because these were incidents happening like then and there, you had to fix those things. Hopefully we'll submit some of those patches upstream. Uh, the other, I mean, this is another interesting point, I think some, a lot of you probably know this if you are using Keystone and OpenStack for a while, is, is that you know, um, the more AZs you add, the more cloud services you add, the tokens get bigger and bigger. And why is that? Because every, with every AZ, you have a, a, a set of URLs in your service catalog. If you have 10 services in each AZ and you have 10 AZs, you have 100 URLs in that. In that. So your catalog is growing, uh, which, is, which is, and we have a lot more services getting added to the cloud. This is not just OpenStack. We have the entire provision, deploy, monitor, remediate services in the control plane, all using Keystone for their identity and access management. So this became a humongous problem. Uh, it's pretty dumb if you think of it, because why would you want to put a catalog in, a, in, the, in, in, the, in the token? And so we ended up patching Keystone uh, to reduce the token size uh, to somewhat manageable levels. Now we are at a point, it's around 2K. Uh, we don't care about uh, uh, catalog in the, in the token anymore. We had to patch some parts of OpenStack to, to get that. The the next, the next topic I want to touch upon is, is, is two-factor two authentication. Uh, I, think, uh, I think it is pretty clear that today if you are using uh, anything <coughs> that is important, you got to, you got to use two-factor authentication. Not Single-factor authentication is no longer the right way to do things. We came to this realization late last year, and, and uh, Keystone, unfortunately, was not where it needs to be. There were blueprints from 2012 and, and so on, but I think there was no activity around it, and this is a bit somewhat surprising given that a lot of enterprises are using OpenStack and they're using Keystone. The fact that uh, two-factor authentication doesn't exist is, I think, is a shame on us, uh, all of us. So we started looking at options to do uh, two-factor authentication, and in order to simplify the policy, uh, we, look, we went back to how we create VPCs and projects and all that. So in our model, a VPC is nothing but a label. So when you create a project in, a, in, in Keystone, uh, we put a label on it. And the label says, you know, you are market, eBay marketplace production, or you are dev, or you are something. So that label is a, is a text string label. And that label tells all the policies. So once, once I get a request based on the project, I know what VPC you, are, you belong to and what policies apply to you throughout OpenStack deployment. So, uh, we define the policy, let's say X VPC requires two-factor authentication or Y VPC does not require two-factor authentication. Based on that, we can enforce it co co completely. Uh, it is entirely dynamic and configuration, de configuration driven. That means as an operator, we can change the policy overnight and gets rolled out uh, fairly quickly through our config management system. And the challenge that we had uh, when we thought about two-factor authentication is how do you keep uh, all your client libraries uh, work with the uh, work with uh, 
work with Keystone because if you add a new extension, suddenly you have Python Swift client or some other client would start breaking because it doesn't know how to authenticate itself with uh, with Keystone. So we decided to overload the syntax of uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, V2 tokens API uh, to for second factor authentication. So as far as the user is concerned, the user still submits his username and and his password. The password is typically you know if you are using RSA, it's typically your uh, your pin like a four or six digit pin followed by a, a changing uh, ever changing uh, identifier. So you submit that. And uh, and and in the background, because we know which project you are trying to authenticate to, we know that you need uh, two-factor authentication, and we would enforce, we would check with the with the backend system for validation. It's fairly straightforward as far as the user is concerned. As we had to figure out, uh, like maintain, make sure the compatibility is there, and uh, so token validation is also very compatible. There is no change that you have to make to support two-factor authentication. I think the the yucky part of uh, this exercise was resync. As you know, some of the two-factor authentication systems like RSA, they have this weird uh, uh, resync protocol. It's not a standard. You have to call up an IT guy. Hey, my token is not working. What should I do? He would say, read your number, and then he would resync. So we had to uh, do some clever extensions on OpenStack. Sorry, Keystone to support that extension so that uh, the portals in uh, DBA that use Keystone for authentication, they, they, can, uh, they can prompt the user, hey, you have to wait for the next 30, 60 seconds, give me your new token, and then you would resync it. So we build those extensions. Uh, it would be great if we can actually as a standardize this model, because I think this is very important, uh, two-factor authentication for all of us. Uh, this has been going on. We have been. This has been in production for about uh, six months. Um, we use. We have enabled it for certain VPCs, not all VPCs yet, because the backend is also uh, not heavily scalable. We want to make sure it's uh, it, it holds the traffic. The the third uh, extension we did, uh, uh, which to API to to Keystone is what is called as API key. I think the idea is fairly straightforward and well known in older and, and more mature cloud platforms like AWS. So the idea of a API key is to support headless use cases. Headless use cases when a user is not uh, presently interacting with, with, with the APIs through some portals or CLI, he's, there's some, probably some code that you have in running in a VM, it's running in maybe a form of VMs, and those VMs need to do something uh, with the control plane. It could be, let's say, getting data in and out of Swift, or you have you're creating uh, uh, VMs because you want to flex up something, uh, flex up a pool of uh, cluster of VMs. So we had to support headless use cases, but putting your COP credentials in, in and distributing in, in VMs is a dumb idea because you're leaking credentials everywhere. And two-factor authentication doesn't work because they are time sensitive. So we had to think of uh, a, a ways to uh, solve this without in increasing the exposure of, uh, of cloud uh, in terms of security is concerned. It's a very, uh, we had to make several iterations. Uh, I think the latest iteration is going to prod just now to make it more and more secure, to reduce attack vectors. So uh, the, mo the, the principle was very, is very straightforward. As a user, uh, you would use an API to create a secret, a, a, an ID and a secret and use that ID and secret in place of your actual credentials. And you can create as many of these credentials as you like. These are, in effect, temporary throwaway credentials. And you, would do, you could revoke, the, as a user, you could revoke those credentials any time. So let's say I deployed an app, and there's a 500 VM app, and I push the credentials into that, those, that, class, that cluster of VMs. And I can decide if I, something happened, I can revoke as a user all the token, all the API, the keys that I, I minted for my project, and everything is go back to normal. So that is the principle we used. Amazon has some uh, features like this. I believe HP at one point had uh, something something like this as well in their Helion uh, distribution. But I don't think uh, these ever made it to the, uh, the upstream yet, and that's something that we need to work on. Uh, the 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 model, as I said, is is a very straightforward. I think the challenge was that. How do you make? How do you reduce the surface vector? Apologies, the diagram is not very uh, uh, well formatted for this size of the screen uh, because of the way the browsers behaved in when I was doing a screen capture. Uh, 
the idea is that when you, uh, let's say I have project P1 and I want to use an API key and I want to make sure that you can use that key pair, that ID and secret only in that context and not, not use it everywhere. Because if you let it use, be used everywhere, you defeat such as things like two-factor authentication. Just imagine, I'm so lazy, I don't want to carry my RSA pin, and I find this feature, oh, I could mint a temporary credentials, I could put that and start using this key pair, and use it until they expire. So I'm, I'm actually bypassing two-factor authentication policy. So we want to make sure it's very restricted. So we wanted to, we did, did it, took, took an approach where you can only operate in a limited context, and with a certain limited roles, and not use it broadly. So you still have to go back to your two-factor authentication if you want to do something, something bigger. And this is you limited for programmatic use cases, only in certain, when the source and destination are well known. So the way it works is that you log into the key, keystone, you have certain roles, you belong to certain groups, <coughs> you have your auth token, and then you say, hey, give me uh, a, a new ID and secret. And at that time, you can choose to grant some of the roles you already have. If you have role A and B, you can say, I want to grant role A for this use case, and I want to grant role B for this use case. But if I don't have role C, I cannot grant the role C for either of my tokens. So I'm basically creating a subset of my abilities when I create the API key. And then I, I can set an expiry, and if the expiry is not set, a default kicks in. That's something that we as administrators set, sets the expiry. And I could as, also choose a scope. Where, from where am I going to use this? Uh, because again, this is, this is to ensure that this can't be widely used. So the default policy is that if you are doing operations, if you have a dev project, and if you're operating in dev resources, you would use it. You can't take the same and use it in a different context, different, let's say, for prod use cases. So optionally, you could, you could limit, even further limit your operations to, let's say, I want to use this for this subnet or this set of IPs. So you further re restrict the, the scope of uh, the keys. And then the outcomes is an API key, which is an ID and secret with an experimented on it. And then I can use that in place of user ID and password anywhere with every OpenStack API. Fairly straightforward once the token is created. Uh, API is, uh, again, uh, uh, straightforward. Uh, you specify a source project optionally. If not, it is default to the current project. You set an expiry. Uh, you give an optional set of roles as a, su a subset of the roles that you already have. And similarly, a set of groups and optionally a set of IP addresses. And if you don't give any of these, they have default to the, your VPC, the current VPC. Uh, and then again, in the implementation, we have several checks and balances to make sure that your authentication is fairly bounded. Uh, that means you can't get out of things and you don't, that you're not allowed to do. So if the caller source, for example, if the token is minted with a set of IP addresses and you're not coming from that IP addresses, we block you. Uh, if, if you are using from a different VPC, the token doesn't work. Uh, if you are using from a, in a different project, it doesn't work. So it's fairly limited. Uh, we still, it, this does not uh, take away the need for, uh, need for using you know, key management systems for distributing keys and all that, distributing keys and secrets. You still need to do that. This is just one extra knob uh, that, that, that we added to, to Keystone. Uh, as I said, uh, we, have never, we have not committed any of these uh, extra enhancements to upstream, and uh, we are working on figuring out uh, the uh, submitting blueprints and, and code submits uh, to upstream. And I think the, the reason why we want to do this is actually, it's not just because it's cool because uh, it's open source, but the main thing is that we want to make sure that uh, OpenStack uh, becomes a, such a standard set of APIs for anything that is cloud-related. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, our Kubernetes journey is relying on OpenStack heavily, and we want to make sure the code that we write to provision and manage Kubernetes clusters on OpenStack can work with standard APIs and not, does not require proprietary extensions that are eBay-specific or some other company-specific. Then that's the reason we want, to, uh, we want to take this code out and, and get some consensus in getting these features out. I think that's my last slide. Uh, we have, I think, ample time for a Q and A, I think about five minutes. Thank you. Yeah, please go ahead. 
So um, early on you mentioned that you had a global keystone. So is, is that a logically global in terms of how you manage the service catalog, or is it actually a, a distributed uh, implementation? <coughs> and the second part of the question is that in the tokens, you mentioned that obviously between the different availability zones, that the tokens would, would get very large. And I wasn't quite sure exactly what you did to, to reduce that or how to manage the, um, the, the size of the service catalogs as that were in the tokens or how you managed access to the data that was in the service catalogs and whether you use endpoint filtering to, to you know, limit the size of those things to what people actually needed. Sure. So the first question was about uh, uh, is, is the, what does it mean by global keystone? The, so, uh, to take a step back, we have this notion of AZ scope services and global services in our, in our cloud. And Keystone is one of the global scoped services. Other, most services are mm -hmm. AZ scoped services. When we say something global, it is still distributed, deployed in multiple availability zones, indep independently managed. Mm -hmm. But since Keystone is stateful, mm -hmm. uh, we may ensure there's a global replication and a global address, address for the customer. So, it is a distributed system. Okay, and you, uh, you manage the replication. We manage the replication through through Galera at the bottom of the stack. Okay. So data is so if I create a project, uh, let's say it gets created on the on the AZ on the left side, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. you might the read might go later on here and you would read it. So the same projects and roles and everywhere exist. If I go to Horizon, uh, which is the dashboard we use, and I I would see all my projects from everywhere. Right, and, and do you expect all the same roles everywhere and every available? Uh, yes, we expect the same roles everywhere. Ah, okay. So okay. that because otherwise it becomes a mess. <laughs> and and uh, coming to the second question, which is how did you deal with the the catalog size uh, with Keystone? So we actually patched Keystone as well as some of the Python client libraries. Uh -huh. uh, patched Keystone to remove the catalog completely from from token, right, right, which okay. is easy. And then we ran through like several tests to see what breaks, mm -hmm. and then fixed, patched the things that broke to not depend on the, on the, on the, okay. on the so catalog. So you, so you did sort of like a, a lazy evaluation or a lazy lookup for what you would need out Absolutely. of the sort of Abs service catalog information. Absolutely, which, which I think is the right thing to do because, yeah. I mean, you, you can always go back and ask, hey, there's an API to get the catalog, you, you get it and use it mm -hmm. instead of carrying it everywhere, which is pretty heavy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. Yes, please. Uh, you talked about the scale of billions of tokens. Right, today. right. Were these headless applications generating so many tokens? Uh, I can't, I don't have the breakdown of whether how much of these headless or, uh, or not. I think we, we actually, uh, we, because we have, the cloud is open for everybody and uh, we ended up spending some time, not a whole lot, to figure out who these users are. Uh, this this happens because clients they get some code some live client library in Java or Python and they start using it without thinking of caching tokens and reusing tokens for a certain duration, and that was that continue, continues to be one of the main reasons that that tokens are so many tokens get generated, and there are also use cases that are short-lived sessions, so you log in you do something and you log out, so when you somebody logs in some the same thing so that is another driver for. No, these are eBay users. We have uh, our Keystone managers. Uh, uh, everybody in our company, every developer, every every PM, every employee has can log into Keystone and do things on uh, on the cloud. So it's it's potentially thousands of users. I think when I last checked, it was we had six seven thousand users uh, in Keystone and, and, and hundreds of thousands of projects. Keystone is integrated to use the corporate LDAP. Uh, again, it depends on the policy. Uh, yes, for, for some cases, yes. Any other question? Oh, thank you.